thank you. And I'm sorry for being I'm sorry for being late. I was teaching in the class, I was teaching in class before, immediately before this session. Um, I would like to actually ask your indulgence to talk not about Mubarak in the international arena primarily, but actually to look um, to raise some issues related to the recent strike wave. I'll come back to the question of how I think this relates to the issue of where Egypt's going and the questions that are raised by many of the chapters in the, in the book, but, um, and I hope I'm not going to be repeating what other people will say. One of the reasons for this is because I've just myself been involved with a research project um, uh, under the Non-Governmental Public Action Research Programme, um, which uh, I've brought with me the report that I've produced um, on some of the aspects of my research, which is looking at the role of leadership within the, uh, uh, within the workers' movement over the last few years, taking a historical perspective. Um, my primary research was uh, looking at the um, national movements in Egypt in the 1940s. Uh, my doctoral research looked at Egypt and Iraq and the movements against the British um, and the question of leadership within those movements, particularly within uh, political organisations and the, the trade union movement. And one of the thing that one of the things that has struck me, um, which again, which I would raise as a as a question, perhaps for discussion and debate, is the many similarities that I could see between the types of movements that have started to develop among workers in Egypt over the current period and the kind of connections that were being made, the kind of independent organisations that dominated the Egyptian political scene uh, throughout a large part of the 1940s up until the revolution of 1952. And this, if you like, brings it back to my chapter in the, in the book because I would argue that in the, 19, in the 1940s, the um, Egyptian regime of the time, the monarchy, faced a very severe internal and external crisis. It was caught in a vice between pressure from the imperial powers of the day, the impact of that of external events, which is the 1948 uh, Nakba in Palestine, um, the absolutely kind of cataclysmic consequences of that for not only for the Palestinians but for the wider for, for the wider region, and that intersected with a huge crisis internally, where the monarchy faced wave of protests, strikes, and, um, uh, and internal challenges that ate away at its um, ability to to rule and paved the way for the revolution of 1952. Why is this relevant? Well, I think that some of the conditions that were there in the 1940s in terms of the emergence of uh, popular forces that are starting to articulate different, uh, potentially different ideas about where Egyptian society could go and are beginning to develop, at least in embryonic form, the forms of organisation to turn those challenges into more than slogans and more than rhetoric. Um, that, that those things are starting to come together in Egypt today. Um, we'll have to see how that develops, but I think the situation today is more like the crisis that faced the monarchy in the late 1940s than it has been at any period, uh, any period since then, despite many punctuations of Egyptian history with huge popular upheavals like the 1977 uh, Red Intifada, the, um, uh, the, the, the protests by um, security forces and police in 1986 uh, and many other, uh, many other crises. Um, there are several reasons why I would make these comparisons. Um, primarily, I would argue, one of, the, uh, one of the major ones is the emergence of uh, currents within the workers' movement, um, which have started to organise themselves independently of the uh, Egyptian Trade Union Federation. Um, I would stress that these are still fairly embryonic developments, but um, the report that I've produced, which I'm going to, everyone is welcome to take a copy of, looks particularly at the case of the Tax Collectors Union, um, which was built out of the national strike by property tax collectors in the uh, late 2007, going into, it was settled uh, with a, a resounding victory for the, uh, for the strike committees uh, in early 2008. And I mean, to give you a sense of the scale that was involved in this case, property tax collectors cover the whole of Egypt. This, the, the kind of level of, t of, of uh, the, the level at which the, the taxation system functions is very primitive um, from by all accounts in terms of it's about collecting fairly small amounts of money by hand instead of going around and talking to people and getting their 
and, and getting their dues. Um, tax collectors, these property tax collectors are extremely low paid, very low paid civil servants, earning maybe 250 Egyptian pounds, 300 Egyptian pounds a month, possibly slightly more if they've had length of service of 12 or 10, 10 or 15 or 15 years. Um, and in late 2007, a, there, a national strike was organised by activists within the property tax agency demanding uh, parity in wages with the general tax authority, um, which translated into a demand for a 300 plus percent um, wage rise. And the height of the strike was um, a, a sit-in at Tassan, outside in Hussein Higazi Street in central in central Cairo, which is outside the General Tax Authority, but it's also around the corner from the Cabinet offices. So if you want to put it in perspective, it would be as if some of the lowest paid uh, civil servants working for the Department of Work and Pensions here, around 10,000 of them, went and camped in Whitehall, outside Downing Street, for 12 days, and slept on the street and had their drums and their, their placards and their megaphones, and then won a 300% pay increase, <laughs> and then formed out of that... Uh, out, out of that um, uh, movement uh, then laid the building blocks for an independent union. Now, you could argue, say, well, what's the significance? Why is it so important to, to fix on this one, one, one union being formed? What makes the tax collectors particularly interesting, and I would argue significant, is that the connection, the organic connection between their organisation and the struggle that they've been engaged in, that the union that was formed out of the out, out of the strike, which was not declared until December last year, uh, December two thousand December two thousand and eight, um, has its roots in workplace based committees uh, across across <coughs> Egypt, a layer of activists that spreads literally across the across the Egyptian state in every governorate, um, and talking to activists in the union that they really do feel that they've co they're connected to the national level and made a national network of activists within their section of the Egyptian uh, of the Egyptian civil service anyway, in a way that actually very few other strike, um, strikers have been able to do that. That Say, if you look at the textile industry, it's often stri it, 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 it's very startling how little connection there often is between, uh, the, the, between strikes in different, in, di in different textile plants, even when they're facing the same conditions, and even when they're often directly following on from, say, a victory in uh, um, Halo Kubra will trigger some uh, people walking out in Kafra Dawar on Tribune of Khons and, so, uh, 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 and, vice, and vice versa. There isn't any organic connections of, of the kind that the tax collectors have been able to make. And um, the other really significant uh, point that I, I would say comes out of the experience of, the, uh, of building the tax, collectors, the tax collectors' union is the idea of, uh, in a sense, the upending of conventional ideas of leadership um, within the workers' movement and within Egyptian society generally, because although there's clearly a dialectic going on between well-known charismatic figures like Kamal Agoita, who's the current president of the Independent Union, uh, and, and some of the, the sort of national level activists within the new union who, are, um, who play a very important role as, as, as speakers and organisers uh, beyond their own workplaces, <coughs> but they, they also describe a process of building leadership from, from below, connected to the day-to-day -day struggles. I'd like to le read out a little bit from an interview I did with Tariq Mustafa, uh, who's the treasurer of the Tax Collectors Union, who came to speak at a workshop at SOAS, which I held in July, um, co-organised with Gilbert here. Um, and uh, he, talked to, he, he talked to me about how they, uh, what it meant to be a, lead a leader in the, in, in the new union. Um, he said, in our experience, the process was clear. Um, the leadership took a clear method of trying to build, build from below. In every government, there is a leadership, and below that, workplace leaderships as well. And I asked him, what would, so who is a leader? How do you know who's, who's playing a leading role in the, in the new union? He said, such a leader would be someone, for example, who has the approval of his colleagues, and in the workplace, an activist, someone who's taking steps beyond his colleagues, the one, he's the one who can encourage them, he's the one who can convince them, who can organise them. Someone speak, who speaks his mind, gives positive suggestions, has a degree of consciousness, and is more, more conscious than his colleagues. And this is all clarified, all put to the test, on the day of the strike or the sit-in, by how many people he can bring with him. And 
what was also interesting was that he made clear that although he's using the male gender in this case, actually it is also applied to women activists, that there are a large layer of uh, women activists within the, um, w within the new tax collectors union. Uh, he said, of course, in society things are arranged differently, but here people are all civil servants. Yes, there are different grades in the same job, but here the leadership might be a woman or someone Christian. How hard they work, how well they're accepted by their colleagues, their conviction about what they're doing. These are the crucial factors. And I would argue that in comparison, if you look at the history of the Egyptian workers' movement over the last 50-odd um, years since the uh, Egyptian Trade Union Federation was formed in, uh, in 1957 with the blessing of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of Nasser's regime, that this completely, uh, on several levels, upends the idea of what leadership means in the workers' movement and, and, and puts a different model a different uh, uh, and, and, and creates a potential of different spaces being organised for, uh, I would argue, democratic debate, discussion, um, and strategic conversations among activists about um, where the workers' movement could go. Now, I would say that this is only, I don't want to overstate the, where, where this has got to, but to come back to the point I raised a few minutes ago about the experience of the, 90, uh, of the 1940s, that I'd be what's, what's in common, one of the common features of the current period and the 1940s was precisely that, that the, there were spaces created where people could organise themselves from below <coughs> and discuss and debate and have those strategic conversations about all sorts of issues, not just the direction of the workers' movement, but what, in terms of um, the liberation of Palestine, in terms of what kind of, what would social justice look like in Egypt, um, what kind of society you know should be should, should be built given the trajectory of economic development and so on, uh, that there were spaces created by the movement from below in the 40s and early 50s that allowed those discussions and debates to to take place. Actually, <coughs> it was cut short, I would argue, by the um, I, by the military takeover in, in 1952. But it seems to me at the utmost importance that these things are beginning to open up again, and I think we're going to hear from Lavab in a lot more detail about how this fits into the broader into the broader picture. And when you take it in conjunction with the emergence of uh, a workers' movement that's starting to eat away at the very foundations of um, the official straight state-run trade union movement, which incidentally also is a is a direct challenge to the whole ruling party's edifice in the sense that. Of course, Egypt, the electoral system is a two-class franchise, that they have the workers and peasants uh, constituencies and uh, professions constituencies, and therefore the Trade Union Federation plays a key electoral role in the official Trade Union Federation in <coughs> mobilising uh, people on election day to go, to, go and uh, make demonstrations in favour of the ruling party's candidates, to stuffing ballot boxes, whatever, I don't, in terms of the... Um, in terms, of, in terms of the multiple roles that it plays, that if that is all being eaten away, even in a small part, by a movement from, by a movement from below, that increases the pressure at a time when the Egyptian regime is still caught in this intolerable vice uh, of its relationship with um, the great powers of the day, in this case the, the US, the role it's playing in the Palestinian conflict <coughs> as a policeman on the... Uh, uh, Acting in, in favour of the U.S. against the um, um, uh, against the, against the, the, the Palestinians, or particularly the Palestinian leadership, when it stands up to the U.S. or attempts to stand up to uh, to, to Israel and make, um, uh, as in the case of, uh, of Hamas in, in in Gaza, and that the conjunction of these factors could lead, um, and I think at the present time the the, the chances of an interaction between these multiple pressures on the regime are much greater than they have been at any time in the last, uh, <coughs> the last 50 years. Well, I can't 